this world is a dangerous place to live in, especially for us as we live between the first and the second comings of Jesus Christ. That perhaps would come closer to us if we this morning were in South Korea or Japan and we were conscious that North Korea was about to launch a missile. That perhaps would help us remember that Jesus said nation will rise against nation, that there will be wars and there will be rumours of wars. Or if it was that you were in Melbourne Friday a week ago and you actually literally felt the effects of that earthquake, you would know that we live in a dangerous world. Jesus said between the period of the first and second coming that there will be earthquakes in various places, that there will be famines and troubles. Those of you who have been with us, We've seen in Mark 13 that Jesus is in the process of answering some questions that the disciples had asked Jesus after they had left the temple. One of them in that temple as they were leaving saw the magnificence and drew Jesus' attention to the magnificence of the Jerusalem temple. And Jesus speaks about that as they are leaving and it's like Jesus hits them right between the eyes. He gives them news that would have been shocking for any Jew to hear. He says in Mark 13 verse 2, Do you see this great, these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. This temple, this magnificent building that you admire is going to be destroyed. When Jesus and the disciples get to the Mount of Olives, which is where they were heading as they left the temple, and they sit on the side of that mountain adjacent to the city and they overlook the temple, that's where they ask specific questions. And those two or three questions were these. Tell us, Lord, when will these things be? When? And what? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? And the first thing Jesus does is not set a date, nor does he outline some spectacular sign. The first thing Jesus does by way of answer to those questions is he says, do not be deceived. Beware of this danger that you have as you live in this world between the first and second coming. Have your eyes open to deception. He then goes on to say, do not be inwardly fearful when you hear about wars, when you hear about rumours of wars, because the end is not yet. When there are earthquakes, when there are natural disasters like Cyclone Hamish or fires or floods in North Queensland, understand this. That's not the sign of the end of the age. It doesn't help to answer the question, when? Because these are the beginnings of sorrows. So we have seen as we've studied that first section of Mark 13 that Jesus is answering the disciples' questions and as he does he gives warnings about the future. But why would he do that? Why does Jesus give warnings? Well boys and girls, why do your parents give you warnings? Why does mum say to you, why does dad say to you, do not touch snakes? Do not play on the road where there is traffic. Well, mum and dad love you. And out of love for you, knowing that there are dangers involved if you touch snakes or you play on a busy road, they tell you, they warn you, don't do that. Well, Jesus, out of love, deep love for his followers, he says to them, don't be deceived. And do not be troubled about natural disasters because he knew what was coming. He knew the dangers ahead and he, out of love, forewarns them. And we see this morning that Jesus moves on in his answer to his disciples to those questions that they ask and he gives more warnings for the future. And our focus is going to be from verses 9 to 13 this morning. And there are two main things that I want to highlight from these verses and they will be these. Firstly, the gospel tribulation and then secondly the gospel triumph and it's rather neat how that falls out it's good to do the good news second I think the gospel tribulation and the gospel 
triumph. But just before we actually come to that, I want you to notice with me, if you look at your Bibles at Mark 13, notice how verse 9 starts the command, the next command that Jesus gives. He says, but watch out for yourselves, or take heed to yourselves. Before it was, take heed to those out there who could deceive you. Now it's take heed to yourselves, or on your part, look continually to yourself. That's to be a continuous, concentrated, personal watchfulness. And each of his disciples are to engage in that throughout the whole period between the first and second coming of Christ. You see, this world is a dangerous place to live in. And it's particularly dangerous for Christians to live in this period. So what's the reason why Jesus gives this command that we should heed, that we should obey, that we should follow this warning? Well, that's the first thing, the gospel tribulation. And this persecution or tribulation that Jesus speaks about, I think you can see this in the passage, I hope you'll be convinced, that it's sort of broken down into four ways. And the first of those four ways comes to us at the start of verse 9 where he speaks about religious or ecclesiastical, that's related to the church, tribulation. Religious or ecclesiastical tribulation. He says in verse 9, but watch out for yourselves, for, here's the reason, they will deliver you up to councils and you will be beaten in the synagogues. Now notice the opposition, where it's coming from, the context. It's from religious people. You'll be beaten, not in, the, not, not in the courts before the magistrates, he's saying here. You'll be beaten in the synagogues. Now, it was actually the case that the synagogues had a form of beating. It, that, that was part of what the Jews did. And there were strict, detailed regulations about how the synagogue beatings or floggings or scourgings were to be followed. And these were some of the, the details that they had outlined that the synagogue scourge, which was actually a, a, a strap, like a leather strap, it's, it's calf leather, it's divided into four thongs and through which smaller thongs were plaited or they were woven together to make it stronger, to have a bit of a stronger impact. There was a limit though, they couldn't just keep flogging them all day. You'll know this from your Bible, those of you who remember what Paul said about what happened to him. There was a limit of 39 lashes. And they broke those 39 lashes into two parts, Thir 13 lashes on the breast, 26 lashes on the back. And the synagogue servant or the synagogue attendant was the one who administered that, that beating and he would stand up on a stone. So he'd get up behind the one getting the flogging, he'd get up higher for greater leverage, have greater effect. And both men and women would receive this beating. Jesus says, you'll be delivered up and you'll be beaten in the synagogues. Now again, those of you who are familiar with your Bibles will know that in the book of Acts, it records for us the horrible hatred that the Jews had toward Christians. And there's even instances of Christians being beaten, isn't there, in the book of Acts. And this prediction that Jesus gives here at the start of verse 9, it's been fulfilled not just in Acts, it's been fulfilled throughout the whole 2,000 years of church history so far. Religious ecclesiastical tribulation. If you're familiar with stories of the men like John Huss, Martin Luther, or even Hugh Latimer, you'll know what they experienced from religious people. There's countless others who have proven Jesus' prediction to be absolutely true. The rigorous religious persecution has continued. It does continue right up to March 2000. And nine, I don't think any of you have literally been whipped or beaten in the religious context, not physically. But have some of you experienced the pain that comes even from religious context? No, not physical pain, but emotional pain? I know it is the case that some of you have. Well, Jesus sounds the warning here and he says, but you watch yourselves. You on your part, watch yourselves how you respond to that. Proverbs 4 says, keep your heart with all diligence. You see, when we experience hostility in whatever form it is in the religious context, when we go through difficult times, when there is pain, we must guard our hearts. 
how we respond to that. It can be like our brother said before, it can soften us or it can harden us in our response. Be watchful to yourself, Jesus says. Be watchful to your own heart response to ecclesiastical opposition or tribulation. Don't allow the personal pain to turn to bitterness. Don't allow it to be an excuse that you hide behind by withdrawing from the true people of God. Jesus says, take heed to yourself. You, on your part, look continually to yourself. So there's this ecclesiastical tribulation. But the second half of verse 9 mentions tribulation in another area, this gospel tribulation in the civil context. Civil tribulation. Look at the second half of verse 9. He says, You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. Now that literally is, you will be made to stand before the civil rulers. You'll be made to stand before the civil authorities, before the kings of this world. Now again, in the first place, we can clearly see how that was precisely fulfilled in the book of Acts. You can see what we could do this morning. We could keep turning back to the book of Acts and show the illustrations of where this is fulfilled, but I'm just making a passing comment about it. The Apostle Paul, was he not made to stand before Felix, Festus and Agrippa? Other Christians we know were made to stand before Nero. And Jesus says, take heed to yourselves. But it gives, if you like, uh, a, a positive purpose for this treatment. Look at the end of verse 9. But why would this happen? He says right at the end, for a testimony to them. In other words, this is a gospel opportunity a unique opportunity that God is giving you through this tribulation. Down through the ages, all the martyrs of church history have had such opportunities. Revelation 6 describes martyrs in this way. It says, those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony to the truth. How many across our world this very day in China, in parts of Africa, in the Middle East like Iran, are made to stand before governing authorities and they are suffering this civil tribulation as Jesus warned back then. They are experiencing this now as we sit here in our comfort. Some say that there are as many as 450 people per day who lose their lives for Christ in our world. I don't know about the figure. God alone knows how many. Isn't it interesting that hundreds die for Christ in our world every day, but we never hear it in the media? Isn't that amazing? When some disaster happens, when a plane crashes and hundreds die, a similar figure, that's reported after in the media. But hundreds dying for Christ all over our world and it's not repeated after. It's not reported. But it is reported, isn't it? It's reported before it happens by Jesus. But the gospel tribulation that the disciples will experience in this age will even come closer to home than that. You look down at verse 12, we see the third aspect, and it's personal tribulation. He says, Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Could there be anything more horrible than what that says? Put yourself in that situation. How horrible is this? The closest human relationships turning sour and deathly. Jesus is speaking about Christ-hating brothers, Christ-hating sons or fathers, turning against, handing over Christ-loving relatives. It's not just a sense of feeling a little distant from your relative who's not a Christian. This is not just a sense of feeling a little bit awkward when you visit them. They're not a Christian. You are. This is delivered over to death, Jesus says, handed over by them so that you actually die. Tragically, that's been experienced today by thousands of believers, especially in Muslim and Hindu cultures in our world. 
people not only cut off from their families and treated as if they are dead, but actually severed from life by their own flesh and blood. The closest human ties, the most natural and tender ties known to man, severed by this personal tribulation. Jesus sounds the warning. Take heed to yourselves. Dangerous times are coming in this age. Guard your heart. Is it not true for us living in this land that we know virtually nothing about these things? So I ask myself when I look at this, well, how is this passage directly relevant for us? As I said before, we haven't been beaten. I don't think it's the case that any of you have been handed over. You're certainly not dead. We're not experiencing like some others are in our world. So how is this relevant for us? Well, we do have contacts. We do have friends. We do have like-minded brethren in other parts of the world who are facing these things. Our dear friends, Arif and Kathy Khan, experienced firsthand this gospel tribulation 18 months ago when they were martyred in their home in Pakistan. I think Hebrews chapter 13 brings it into our immediate relevance. If you'd like to turn your Bibles to Hebrews 13. Because it speaks about those who are not experiencing severe tribulation as others are, but it tells them what they are to do. So this is us. Hebrews 13 verse 3. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Try and picture yourself shackled with them in those prisons, he says. What else does he say? Those who are mistreated, since you yourself are in the body also. We have bodies, they have bodies. They are suffering in their bodies. We are not. Put yourself in those shackles with them in your minds. Remember them. Like those in India who I've read about in the last week, in a section of India, where there are Hindu militants who are targeting Christian leaders in recent days and there's the going price to kill a pastor is $250. You want a quick 250 bucks? Knock me off if you live there and it's yours. I'm glad I don't live there. But friends, the day will soon come if things continue in the direction they are going when we actually could experience open persecution ourselves in this country. If the federal government try and put into place legislation that they are currently considering that relates to religious freedom in our land, we might be heading into tribulation sooner rather than later. Jesus says, you watch yourselves. But in verse 13 you'll see that there's the fourth aspect and that's universal tribulation. He says in the start of that verse, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Isn't that a sweeping statement? None of us are immune from that one. Hated by all. You notice the basis of this universal tribulation. Hated by all. Why? Because you support some football group and they don't? Hated by all because you support some political party and they don't? No. Jesus says you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. It's on my account. It's for my sake that you will be hated by all. Now we might not have the aggressive, assertive, open, horrible hostility in our culture but I think we have a quiet hostility. We have a quiet hostility toward Christ in our society. We have a quiet hostility towards Christ Follows us like woven into the very fabric of our society. Men hate Christ. Women hate Christ in our society. As uncomfortable as this subject makes all of us feel, it's not exactly a nice, pretty subject for me to preach on, 
but we're committed to exp expounding all of Mark. But as uncomfortable as this subject may feel as we hear it, tribulation belongs to Christ's disciples. It's ours. And any thinking that Christians are snatched away from tribulation between the first and second coming of Christ, I would say to you, is out of step with Jesus' clear teaching. Please turn with me to the clear teaching of Jesus in John. John chapter 15. And we'll read a few verses in these few chapters here in 15, 16 and 17. John 15 verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Chapter 16, verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Look at verse 33. Could words be any plainer in verse 33? These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In the world you will have tribulation. Chapter 17, please. And it's the record of Jesus' prayer to his Father. You could ask the question, do you think Jesus always prays in his name? Of course he does, he's Jesus. Does he pray the Father's will? Would Jesus' prayers be answered? Let's listen to what Jesus prays. In chapter 17, verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I don't pray for you to snatch them away. They're going to be in the world and in tribulation. I pray that you would preserve them, that you'd keep them. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The scriptures are clear. We are promised tribulation due to our relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to clarify that. This is not addressing, this is not talking about general trials. It's not what this is talking about. All men experience, all people experience general trials. Nor is this about tough times that we bring upon ourselves due to our, due to our own silly choices and sinful activities. This persecution is due to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And friends, in our flabby, comfortable and complacent generation, this is not a popular message, even with Christians. The church today yearns for ease. The church today yearns for entertainment. We want fun. That's the message really that's coming. We want fun. I mean, give us the activities, give us the excitement that we want in our Christianity. Tribulation is the lot of the people of God in this age. This world is hostile to Christ and to his followers. This world is a dangerous place for faithful Christians to live. It's ecclesiastical. There's civil, there's personal, and there's universal tribulation. And perhaps we could say, why? God in his wisdom has ordained all this tribulation and opposition is to be experienced by the people of God for our good. You might say, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I mean, which planet did you come from? You've got to be kidding. How can tribulation be for our good? 
Well, friends, God knows that we need constantly reminding that his kingdom is not of this world. God knows that we need constantly reminding that this world is not our home. We are to be in this world, but we are not to be of this world. You see, gospel tribulation or persecution helps us not to sink our roots down too deep here. We must constantly wrestle with this tension that we live in this world, but we are not to be of this world. That means we, we, must, we must earn a living. God is ordained that we should earn a living. That's what he would expect of us. We must work to earn a living. But that must not be our primary focus or our primary our priority, if you like, of life as Christ's disciples. Our employment. Maybe it's your farm or maybe it's your business. Our recreations have a legitimate part to play in our lives as Christians in this world. But they must not intrude. They must not invade the more important issue of the health of our souls that will live forever. They must not invade or intrude with the priority that Jesus made very plain in Matthew 6.33 and that's the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what does God do? God sends opposition to the Christian to help us to have the right priorities. It's so easy for us to become too attached and too connected to this world and all of its ways. Our efforts, our choices, our dreams, our finances, our energies should be having a priority for God's kingdom. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. You see, the gospel tribulation that Christians experience in the age between the first and second coming of Christ helps us not to be living for ourselves. It detaches Christians from this decaying world. We are on planet Earth not to live for ourselves as Christians, but to live for Christ who died for us and rose again for us. We are to live for God's glory. And of course, as his disciples, he has given to us a priority task to do as we live for his glory. You see, that which Jesus outlines by way of opposition here in Matthew, uh, Mark 13, is closely related to the gospel, isn't it? I've called it gospel tribulation deliberately because Jesus says in this passage, it's tribulation for my sake. And in the midst of all of this, which probably seems like to you nothing but bad and discouraging news. Jesus gives some extremely positive news about the gospel and about the future. So I think by now you're probably ready for some good news. Let's think now in the second place about the gospel triumph. And I want to draw your attention to this wonderful verse, verse 10. Let's read it. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Now at first sight, at first reading, that verse looks out of place. You think, oh, hang on, did Mark, when he was writing this down afterwards, did he sort of forget where that sentence was? Did he put it in the wrong place? It looks out of place. But after closer examination, it's not out of place at all. It's wonderfully put in the right place. This is what Jesus says. You see, Jesus places this marvellous incentive before his disciples who otherwise might get scared off due to the inevitable opposition and hostility. If you had a, a gospel leaflet that you're distributing in the local area here and you went to put it in a letterbox, but right next to that letterbox is an angry, hostile dog. You know it. You hear the sound. You see the fangs. You see the position. You see the hair on the back of his neck. You know that's anger and that's hostility. You'd probably be scared off if that's all you saw and that's all you knew. Unless you knew that in the end that leaflet would meet with gospel success. 
And I would dare say many of you would have the courage to persevere through that potential danger to put that gospel leaflet in that box which could lead to that person's salvation. Such news, you see, would be marvellous. Marvellous incentive in facing the hostility. And Jesus gives extremely positive and thrilling news here. He gives a marvellous incentive. He says the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Now last time we were Mark 13, we had a divine must be. You may remember the expression I put that way. These things must be. We have another divine must be here. The gospel must be preached to all the nations. This is God's will. This is his decree from eternity. The sovereign God will save all his elect people and he will do so via the proclamation of his gospel. Yes, watch out for yourselves due to the tribulation that we'll experience, but don't stop fulfilling your duty. You had to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But whatever opposition arises, it won't be able to stop this. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So what is this divine must be? The gospel must be preached. Don't try and tone down the message to make it more acceptable or not so offensive to them. Don't try and so-called make it more relevant for our culture. Jesus says, this must be my gospel. Not your ideas of what you think people need. The language, the clear language Jesus uses is the gospel. Like there's only one true gospel. The biblical gospel must be preached. That's the divine must be. And yet we not only have no right to change the message, neither do we have a right to change the method. Look again at the text, verse 10. The divine must be is that the gospel must be preached. That's the word for held. It must be held throughout the entire world. There must be the sending forth of heralds, proclaimers of God's word who come in God's authority. God has ordained, according to 1 Corinthians 1, the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. What a tremendous incentive to keep going on the dangerous path. This gospel must first be preached to all the nations before the end comes. That's not mentioned there, but it's in Matthew's account. He remember Jesus is answering the disciples' questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of the end of the age? Jesus says, despite the opposition of the gospel and at times fierce tribulation and hostility, the gospel of Christ will triumph. That's the message. The gospel will triumph. Notice where the gospel will triumph. The divine must be. He says the gospel must be preached to all the nations. And that word in the original nations, from that Greek word we get our English word ethnic. So Jesus says the gospel is to be heralded to all ethnic groups. He's not just talking about continents or political or geographical boundaries. The gospel must be, it will be preached to all people groups, all people of different ethnic backgrounds. It will be preached to all of them. We know that is the case. Because the Bible gives us an insight into the future. In Revelation 5 and 7, we studied this on Friday night, it tells us who will be in heaven in the end. That is the people who have been saved by hearing and believing the gospel. They will be ones from every tribe, every tongue, every people and every nation. It's the same word, every ethnic group, every people group. Christ will build his church and he will do so through the gospel and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gospel triumph. You see, here is Jesus envisaging the worldwide missionary activity of his church throughout this period from the first and second coming of Christ. Remember where he is. He's seated on the, on the side of the Mount of Olives. He's overlooking Jerusalem. In a, just a couple of days, Jesus is going to die. And he speaks about the worldwide penetration of his gospel. And yet he knows 
that this international declaration of his gospel will occur in the context of hostility. Jesus not only gives the big picture in verse 10, but he speaks about something by way of personal assistance to his disciples, that which relates to how Christians are to handle themselves when they find themselves in the grip of some of this gospel opposition. Look at verse 11. This is an amazing thing that God says he will do. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives some commands there that relate to how to conduct yourself in this age of tribulation. See what he says. It's another command. Do not worry beforehand. Think of that hostile dog. Maybe that's our persecution. An angry response from a friend or family member that you're trying to bring the gospel to. What's our response to that? Anxiety. Sleeplessness. It stresses us. I'm not trying to diminish that. It's difficult. But friends, try and imagine the depth of hostility that some of God's people are facing today when they have a gun to their head about their profession of faith. Jesus is speaking about a level of anxiety here that probably none of us have yet experienced and I hope we don't. This term that he uses is a forceful term for unusual, extraordinary anxiety that's caused by facing unusual difficulty. And not, again, he's not talking about people who've done something silly and, you know, it's all gone sour for them. He tells us the context. He tells us these people have been arrested. They have been delivered up. This is for Christ's sake. That's the context of what this is happening. Jesus gives this clear command. Do not worry. Why not worry? Premeditate on what you should say. Don't stress out. Only How am I going to survive? What, what am I going to say? Jesus says, I'll give you the words. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. I'll give you the words. So here we have this tremendous promise for God's people who find themselves facing this intense hostility. Here is what we pray for, for them, friends. This is what has been promised. We can claim this as we pray for them. You see, even there the gospel will triumph because the good God will give the very words that are needed as they live out the good news. The Holy Spirit who dwells within will give the right words to say just at the right moment. Therefore, do not stress beforehand. So here in this passage, we have what otherwise might seem like discouraging and fearful uh, futures before God's people. Jesus gives some wonderful positive incentives to persevere in the age of difficulty as we live in a dangerous world. He points his disciples, he points us in the right direction. Jesus here helps us to refocus even in our culture. The disciples, remember, are wanting the answers to the when and the what. They wanted the sign of the end of the age. And Jesus says, you don't need to know some fancy chart of what someone thinks is going to unfold at the end of time. What you need to know is that there will be tribulation throughout the whole period. So Jesus gives clear commands. Watch out for yourselves. Do not stress beforehand. Stay focused on the task of living for me. Living for my glory where I have placed you, proclaiming my message in all the world. And understand this, that the true biblical gospel will triumph in the purposes of God. The gospel of Christ will not fall over. It will triumph. Though the devil may rage, the lion may roar, those dogs may bark, the world may oppose, the gates of hell will not prevail. Christ will build his church. He will do it in his way, in his time, and he will bring every one of his elect people into his kingdom via the ordained means of the preaching of the gospel and they will be people from every tribe and every tongue. 
So surely the Lord would say to us today as we live in this flabby culture, don't get distracted by the things of this world. Yes, do your best in the workplace. But don't lose sight of your God-given priorities of seeking first my kingdom and my righteousness. I died for you. I rose again from you. You are now alive. Now live for me in this world. And see the persecution as a helpful prod to get back to the task. A help that we might not get caught up in this passing world. In this age, disciples will have tribulation. But despite the hostility, there will also be worldwide gospel success. Why? Because God gives the grace that his disciples will be faithful to him and will continue to proclaim his word to the ends of the earth. So friends, may we settle it in our minds afresh today in light of these things. May we settle it afresh. May it be like a fresh opportunity of rededication and refocus. Lord, I'm committed to you. I'm committed not only to you, you are the head, and you are the head of the body. I'm committed to your body, I'm committed to your church. And I'm committed to the task that you have given to your church. I'm committed to living the gospel, spreading the gospel. I'm committing to pouring the energies of my prayers for the gospel success and for those who are suffering for the gospel, not like I am. I'm committed, Lord, to giving generously my finances toward gospel endeavours. Maybe the Lord is asking some of you, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And maybe some of you should be thinking, here I am, Lord. Send me. Is God calling you? Is God calling you as a man to put aside your career? Your bright future you think is in front of you? Is God calling you to leave your comfortable future as you perceive it now and to give yourself to gospel ministry? There is a desperate shortage of workers. The harvest is plentiful. The labour is a few. Who will go for us? Who shall I send? Here am I. Send me. Yes, Lord, I'm committed to give my own physical energies to ensure your gospel is preached in all the world. Starting in my own workplace. Starting with my work colleagues. Starting with that conversation at morning tea break tomorrow. Starting in my neighbourhood. Starting in my classroom. Starting even in my own family. I'm committed to giving my own physical energies for your glory, for your gospel. I'm committed to all of this because I know in the end it will triumph. It's the triumphant message of the sovereign God. And I'm committed to it because I know that Revelation 7 and verse 9 will come to pass one day. There will be a great multitude that says that no one will number of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. May God give us then the grace to persevere, maybe for some of us the prod to get out of our selfishness and our complacency to stop pining about the pain in the past and to move forward in the things of God to live and to serve him in a hostile and dangerous world. Please pray with me.